With Laker, you can fly round trip to the USA or Canada in one of our wide body DC tents for less than half the price of a normal economy ticket. Look, I've got to give you a better deal. I've got my name on every plane. In America, a Harvard professor named Stephen Breyer was put in charge of a Senate investigation of airline regulations. You discovered that basically the same firms that had been there in 1938 were still there. Uh, those were the major carriers and nobody knew. The hearings began and officials from the Civil Aeronautics Board were called to testify. And it turned out that 5% of their time went to stop prices that were too high, and 95% of their time went to stop prices that were too low. But always the effort was to keep the price high and not low. Naturally, the established airlines were quite happy with this arrangement. And we'd say, when was the last time you granted a new route? Well... Regulations meant that major carriers like Pan Am never had to compete with newcomers. At the hearing, Freddie Laker challenged the status quo. And the transportation department said that this may hurt Pan Am. And Freddie Laker testified and said, the cause of this whole thing is Panamania. So we said, what is that? And he said, well, everybody should do everything for Pan Am. The man who was to sweep away airline regulations is a lifelong Gilbert and Sullivan fan. Improbably enough, the bearded poet is played by Fred Kahn, a professor at Cornell University. Kahn wanted a leaner, meaner regulatory environment in which the market was free to chase profits without the dead weight of bloated government. President Carter made him head of the Civil Aeronautics Board. Now Khan had a chance to put his ideas into practice. And when I got to the Civil Aeronautics Board, the biggest division under me was the division of enforcement. In effect, FBI agents who would go around and seek out secret discounts and then impose fines, we, we, would, we would discipline them. It was illegal to compete in price. That means it was illegal to compete in the discounts you offer travel agents. So we regulated travel agents' discounts. Internationally, since they couldn't cut rates, they competed by having more and more sumptuous meals. We actually regulated the size of sandwiches. By the time Khan had finished, the CAB had nothing left to do but close itself down. Competition is the rule. And because of it, the consumers are better served than ever. Airline deregulation led to painful turbulence as new carriers came and went. But 20 years later, the industry was employing two times as many people to fly almost three times as many passengers. The industry vastly underestimated the demand at, for airfare at lower prices. And what's happened is that as the prices went down, demand went up dramatically. And once they were free to compete, you began to get super saver fares and super apex fares and potato fares and peanuts fares. And so an explosion of discounting and competition. Well, those were dramatic. The stage was set for deregulation of the US economy. And now these ideas we're about to make their entrance in the very homeland of Gilbert and Sullivan. Well, five percent no good to nobody, is it? Do you think you can win this strike? Yes, I do. They called it the winter of discontent. It seemed as if everyone was on strike. I think it stinks like all the other damn strikes in this country run by the filthy socialist communist unions. 
The dustmen were out, so were the ambulances. And if you died, the gravediggers were out too. With the economy in apparently terminal decline, the people voted for a new conservative government, headed by Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher was elected prime minister on the day of my father's birthday. So he sent her this telegram from Freiburg. Thank you for the best present to my 80th birthday that anyone could have given me. And a few days later, she wrote back from 10 Downing Street. Dear Professor Hayek, I'm very proud to have learnt so much from you over the past few years. I am determined that we should succeed. If we do so, your contribution to our ultimate victory will have been immense. Yours sincerely, Margaret Thatcher. And I'll strive unceasingly to try to fulfill the trust and confidence that the British people have placed in me and the things in which I believe. Determined, and some said strident, she would revolutionize the economy. The spirit of enterprise had been sat upon for years by socialism, by too high tax, by too high regulation, by too high public expenditure. The philosophy was nationalization, centralization, control, regulation. Now, this had to end. Thatcher squeezed government spending and cut subsidies to business. Thousands of bankruptcies and higher unemployment followed. Many saw her as uncaring. Britain had rarely been so divided. Thatcher had no time for conventional Keynesian economists who urged her to use government money to lessen the pain. Although 364 economists wrote to the Times and said, this is outrageous, you'll put us into a deep depression from a recession, 364 were wrong and the half dozen who supported us were right. And those who urge us to relax the squeeze to spend yet more money indiscriminately in the belief that will help the unemployed and the small businessman, and not being kind or compassionate or caring, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> the ladies not for turning. <laughs> In Britain, the battle lines were drawn. In America, the fight was already underway. Things were at a low in the United States. Revolution in Iran had led to a second oil shock. Under President Carter, inflation was at record heights. Jimmy Carter was maybe the, the high point of Keynesian uh, behavior, um, and it simply was not working. With inflation out of control, Carter appointed Paul Volcker as chairman of the Federal Reserve. It's obvious uh, to all of you from what's been said today that we're face to face with really unique economic difficulties. Volker was steeped in the ideas of the Austrian school of economics. It came to be considered part of Keynesian doctrine that a little bit of inflation is a good thing. And of course what happens then, you get a little bit of inflation, then you need a little more. If it peps up the economy, people get used to it, it loses its effectiveness like an antibiotic. You need a new one, you need a new... And I certainly thought that inflation was a dragon that was eating at our innards. So our need was to slay that dragon. Volker used a blunt weapon. He tightened the money supply. The economy went into a nosedive. Facing a presidential election, 
Carter was reluctant to back such harsh measures. Carter's rival was the Republican, Ronald Reagan. Reagan shared the same economic philosophy as Margaret Thatcher. For over 20 years, he had been campaigning against the Keynesian orthodoxy and for Hayek and Friedman's ideas of free markets and freedom. Reagan knew Hayek personally, and he knew Milton Friedman personally. And Reagan was, in a sense, their popularizer. So he was the person who could take the, these people who were very profound but not very easy to communicate. I mean, I don't think you'd ever get Hayek on the Today Show. But you could get Reagan explaining the core of Hayek with better examples in a more understandable language. Vote for me if you believe in yourself. If you believe in your right to control your own destiny and plan your own life. Yes, and have to say the say with the spending of your own money. The president is going to have more government on the backs of the people and of business and of industry, the working people, in order to try to solve the problems that were created by too much government on our backs. We can get government off our backs, out of our pockets. This kind of indifference to economic disaster must be ended, and it'll be ended by having a different kind of leadership. The American people voted for change, and Reagan became president. The situation was this. The only way you could get the inflation down was by having monetary contraction. There was no way you could do that without having a temporary recession. Obviously, who wants a recession? But I can remember President Reagan using those famous words, if not now, when? If not us, who? Reagan offered Volcker his moral support in the fight against inflation. As Volcker tightened the money supply, the economy slowed and contracted. Unemployment hit 10%. Nobody had realized quite how tough it would be. All across the heartland of America, ordinary people were hurting. If you had told me in August of 1979, with interest rates, the prime rate would get to 21 and a half percent, I probably would have crawled into a hole. I would have crawled into a hole and cried, I suppose, but I, we lived through it. <laughs> It had taken three years, three years of growing public anger, three years of real hardship for millions of Americans. But by 1982, the dragon of inflation had been slain. What changed drastically in the 1980s and running through today is the kind of presumption that Inflation is bad. The primary job of a central bank is to prevent inflation. That's a, a very different environment than the 50s and 60s. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Reagan and Volcker had set the United States on a new economic course. From our very first day, We've been working to undo the economic wreckage they left behind. They called his policy Reaganomics. It had four key elements. The first was the concept of sound money. Uh, the second was deregulation. The third was modest tax rates. And the fourth was limited government spending. Um, sounds pretty conventional now. But when Reagan was elected, he was vilified by his opponents as being some radical extremist. They just can't accept that their discredited policies of tax and tax, spend and spend, are at the root of our current problems. Reagan's tax cuts, the biggest in history, led to huge deficits. 
Our program has only been in effect But the economy started to grow steadily again. There's no doubt in my mind that those actions of Reagan, lowering tax rates, plus his emphasis on deregulating, 